Good morning and welcome to the launch of Black History Month Southampton 2020 here at the John Hansard Gallery in Southampton. A slightly different format to our usual presentations, but nonetheless, we have a packed agenda for the day. I'm Lou Taylor, Director of Black History Month South CIC, and with me today are my colleagues and co-presenters. To my left, I have Veronica Gordon, who is the founder of Our Vision Media CIC. And to my right, I have my good friend, Olu Rowe, Black History Month South coordinator. Welcome. So I'd like to introduce to you the Right Worshipful, the Mayor of Southampton, Councillor Sue Blatchford, to open the event. Thank you, Lou. Well, good morning. It's National Libraries Week next week, and I was asked to choose my favourite book. I came close to picking my enormous dictionary and decided to actually look at the word history the study of past events, series of past events connected with someone or something. So black history matters. Having been the mayor before in 2014, I attended Black History Month. Lord Herman Oosley was also there with a role as chair of Kick It Out. And to mark local action at St Mary's, I took my racism just ain't saintly t-shirt. Six years on, history, the study of past events. Racism still exists in football, on the terraces, in the stands and on the pitch. Why? Through all the history of black footballers, from Walter Tull to Marcus Rashford, from the history of the game, has there been no change in attitudes towards black players? But it's great the role Marcus Rashford played with child hunger. Black History Month was started by Carter Woodson in the USA in 1926, the same year as the Queen was born, 94 years ago, and first celebrated in the UK in 1987. 33 years ago, Black History Matters. What has happened from all those past events? Where are the lessons learnt from past Black History Months? What changes have happened from looking at Black History? The phrase Black Lives Matter came from 2012 and Trayvon Martin being murdered by George Zimmerman. Eight years later, Yet another killing with George Floyd. Black history matters. There are continuing episodes of police associated deaths. Is it that societal historical link with slave patrols who hunted and killed those slaves who ran away so that today they're still traumatizing black people? The topic of removing statues and changing road names is that black history matters. For those statues like people of Edward Colston, who represented the awful Royal African Company, and therefore individuals who believed in and actually took part in slavery, bigotry, hatred, and oppression. It is important to learn the history of Britain's uncomfortable past. The continued existence of Black History Month and its usefulness is key. Black history does matter. It matters that black history is brought to and highlighted in the public domain. It should be a platform for enriching and enlightening our communities, especially here in Southampton. As it matters, there is more to black history than Mary Seacole and Walter Toll. For if you go away, do the research, reading and educate yourself, 
you will find others like the nurse Princess Adimola from Nigeria and footballer Jack Leslie, Leslie from Plymouth Argyle as just two examples. The young are more likely to learn about African Americans from history, but there is an alternative black history here in Southampton with the book Black History of Southampton from the 16th century to the 21st century, written by Don John and Stella Muirhead. In wider UK history, not Julius Caesar, but Septimus Severus. There doesn't have to be a lack of exposure to meaningful black history that young people can identify with. As mayor, Remembrance Sunday is already featuring in my emails. The Cenotaph was erected in 1920, an outcome of commemorating those who'd fallen in the First World War. Stephen Bourne's 2014 book, Black Poppies, Black Community and the Great War, reminds us of the sacrifices made, especially on the battlefields by the black community. As mayor, I'm delighted that I could take part in this virtual launch event. Southampton has a rich and diverse community and rightly celebrates Black History Month as Black History Matters and matters all through the year, not just in October. Thank you, Councillor Sue Blatchford. I'd now like to introduce you to Woodrow Kernham from John Hansford Gallery who have kindly loaned us their venue to hold this event. Welcome. Um, my name is Woodrow Kernahan and I'm the director here of John Hansard Gallery, part of the University of Southampton. We are committed to ensuring that everyone feels welcome here and we're extremely proud to support and host this morning's virtual Black History Month's South launch during these challenging and unprecedented times. Many thanks, Olu, Lou, Veronica. I am deeply honoured to be invited to say a few words of welcome. Firstly, I would like to say a warm welcome to our friends, colleagues and esteemed speakers and everybody who's watching online. And we hope to be able to welcome everyone back to the gallery in person very soon. Coinciding with the launch of Black History Month South today, we are thrilled to launch a brand new film called Reliquary 2 that we've commissioned by the extraordinary artist Larry Achiampon. This stunning film features Larry's son, Sinai, animated by the illustrator Wumzum and explores Larry's personal experience of the COVID lockdown and isolation from his children. This film is available to watch from today through our website at www.jhg.art and complements Larry's Pan-African flags on the front of our gallery that you can see here behind me as well, uh, both running from now until the end of January. The University of Southampton's vision is to change the world for the better. And at John Hansard Gallery, we fully embrace this by working with artists from across the UK and around the world to celebrate the rich diversity of contemporary creativity. Since moving to Southampton City Centre in 2018, we have been forging strong links and co-devising exciting projects with our local communities and groups, including Black History Month South, the Black Heritage Association, TUVA, Women's Integration Group, Schools for Sanctuary, and many more. During the lockdown at John Hansard Gallery, we have taken this time of closure as an opportunity to renew our commitments to equality, diversity and inclusion, and to respond to the Black Lives Matter movement. We have set up a task force to review our policies and procedures, and are introducing a new code of conduct and safe space policy, and are educating ourselves by undertaking active bystander, unconscious bias and anti-racist training. Quality, diversity and inclusion are at the heart of our ethos and ambitions and we are committed to making positive change. As part of University of Southampton, we are signed up to the Race Equality Charter and positively work to improve representation, progression and success, success of minority ethnic staff, students within higher education, as well as artists, art professionals and audiences here within the visual arts. Our commitment to the Race Equality Charter is part of the wider set of values that underpin the university's civic role and investment in the city, uh, in the cultural life of the city and its communities. We will work closely alongside our colleagues in the university's equality, diversity and inclusion team, the Shine Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Staff Network 
and student union to ensure that our program, our team, participants and audiences are reflective of and relevant to our diverse black and multi-ethnic communities here in Southampton. This is an urgent and ongoing journey towards positive change. Thank you, Olu, Lou, Veronica, and for inviting me to say a few words. And I look forward to the rest of this morning's launch and the fantastic programme for the month ahead. I hope you enjoy Larry Atchampong's new film, Reliquary 2. And thanks also to Lynn Dick, the John Hansard Gallery Head of Engagement, and Diana Jokey, our Communities Curator, for supporting and making this launch possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Woodrow. Now, good morning. Black History Month South is supported by a range of sponsors. We would like to invite a representative from long-standing supporter and sponsor of this year's Black History Month magazine, Radian, to say a few words. Welcome to Vinda Bamra, Radian's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Manager. Thank you all, and I'm really happy to be speaking at this event. Um, as a broadcaster, I'm the Equality and Diversity Manager for Radiant, and I've been in post for about nine months now. So when I think about Black History Month, it's a chance for me to listen to people's lived experiences, reflect and grow as a person. But the events of this year have meant that we not only need to look, listen and reflect, but we also need to act upon what people are telling us. So I have been brought in to develop the diversity and inclusion agenda. And I had to take a step back and look at what Radiant had done before and what's gone before. So we've had 10 years of the Equality Act, multiple years of having audits, commissions, reviews. Um, and my question back to that is if we've had the law that compels us to look at how um, our policies and process impact upon the game communities, why has the dial not changed? Why are one in four uh, school children still from the BAME community, uh, from the community, but only one in 16 um, at board level? Um, for me, it's time to look at ourselves and take a step back and say, well, what do we really need to do? And for me, it starts with that change from within. So at Radiant, what we're doing is um, uh, embarking upon an, an ambitious programme, not just of behavioural change, but actually supporting activities. So, for example, I will be developing, um, let's talk about race sessions with our staff. So staff understand the impact of race in the workplace. We've also got an ambitious agenda called Voice of the Customer that actually looks at customer empowerment, listens to customers. We have a specific scrutiny panel that looks at services where we feel that are falling short of the mark. And that can lead to some extent to some uncomfortableness in the organization. We're always very good at patting ourselves on the back and understanding where we think we think we do things well, but we want to understand where we're not doing things so well and how they can how that can impact upon disproportionately on communities uh, across the southeast of England. We're also embarking on a, a really significant community investment program of which community empowerment, community engagement, and also uh, job opportunities for um, communities is a really key pillars for that because we understand that in order to have healthy, safe, really resilient communities, we need to incorporate, incorporate things like good job prospects, better health outcomes, and also looking at community safety. Why is community safety so important? Well, we understand that actually communities, people's homes are just not about where they um, live, but also the communities that they live in. And um, your front door and your community just doesn't stop when you walk inside your house. Um, we're also going to, we've also embarked upon a two year action plan and you will see very soon that we have our mission statement um, holding us to account for what the change that we want to bring in communities. We have a new strategy in place and a very, very ambitious two year action plan, which, which is overseen by our board, our chief executives, our senior sponsor. 
um, as I said, it is an ambitious plan. And we're starting right back at the beginning at understanding who our communities are. When I came in, it was quite evident that we really didn't have a grip on where our communities were at, um, in, in, in the southeast of England and who we were actually serving. So there's an ambitious program to have a real um, understanding of how data collection, data insight can inform the work that we do. Um, last but not least, it's also about collaborating with organizations such as Black BHM South. So we can take this agenda further. We want to listen and respond to our communities. Um, and if I could take a, take a leaf from my policing days, it would be that every contact matters. And that's what we want to do at Radiant, ensure that every contact matters. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Savinda. And who would have known that you were a police officer in the past? That's interesting news. Um, so Hampshire Constabulary has been a long-term supporter of Black History Month. And today, I'm pleased to say that this year, as in previous years, we have with us the Chief Constable of Hampshire Constabulary, Olivia Pinkney. Thank you, Lou. Um, it is so good to be here and have these just these few minutes just to share some thoughts, but also very much to listen to everyone else who's contributing today at the beginning of this really important month. Um, others have reflected, but you know, the killing of George Floyd in America at the hands of policing. Um, that's a huge, huge deal for all of us across the globe. I'm clear, of course, there is no place for any action like that in UK policing. But I realise that global events shape local views. Um, and there's some really important things to hear and some hard things to hear. But one of the genuine pluses from the horrors, and I use that word appropriately uh, this summer, uh, over the water, was that people have come forward and have made personal contact with me that I would never have heard of before. Um, and they have kind of shared, and they're from, some many are from Southampton, they've shared firsthand how my organisation needs to do more. And that isn't stuff that features on data or on strategies. And it's their lived experience, um, which I am really listening to, my colleagues are really listening to, and they are helping us uh, improve our policing ever more. Um, my personal motivation, I grew up in policing in Bristol and I've seen, you know, the events there and that is a city built on slavery and slavers in terms of its wealth. Um, and I was really struck by how my colleagues today are policing today within the context of the history of that city uh, and how nuanced and delicate and important that is. So my reality, my lived experience is rooted very much in that. And I think one of the things I've reflected on, because I hope those of you who've heard, who, you know, I know lots of people on this and we have spent a lot of time working together. But I hope you know that I am really committed to doing more. And yet this summer made me really reflect after an entire career, not over yet, in policing that we need to do even more. And for me, that's transparency, transparency, transparency. And I'll give you an example. We had a number of really important marches and protests this summer regarding Black Lives Matters all over the constabulary area. Um, we work really closely. We're very grateful to the organizers to work with us because it was our business very much to help people have their say safely. Um, but we went further than that and we invited members of the community into our police control room to see how we do this, to see how we do delicately balance um, our role around public safety um, and lawful and peaceful protest. And I'm really grateful to people who, who bother to do that and to join us so they can A, see what we do, but B, help us improve what we do. Because one of the big takeaways for me is that I really want to encourage people to kind of be the change they want to see. I know policing isn't perfect. I know we really are, try, we try, we are hugely transparent. We will do more and more and more, but we are a monopoly public service. So we really need to have voices helping influence us. 
and there's an opportunity and it's a blatant sell and I shall make it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I welcomed 91 new constables to Hampshire Constabulary. We are recruiting in a way we haven't done for decades. Um, it won't last forever. We know where we are in austerity coming again with a recession, but we have got this opportunity once in more than a generation and I am determined to use it because I am very clear that the recruitment of officers into my constabulary needs to be from all of the communities we have the privilege to police. It will make us better, it will make us richer, it will make us much more understanding of the communities we serve. Because I, and therefore I need people to come and be that change they want to see. We are on the way to it, we're doing so much, so much uh, to change that profile. And I'm hugely encouraged by people who are coming to join us uh, from all communities um, and they will have a great career with us. I'm, I'm absolutely certain of that. But I do need people to have a think about, to dip their toe in to working with policing and, and be that change that they want to see. Um, I know there's a disconnect. I'm really aware there is a disconnect with, with some people, particularly we have not yet earned the trust of some young black men and I really need to put that work in and change that. I want us to understand and to build that trust and then attract some of those uh, young men to come, and women, to come and, and work with us. Um, so it's a, it is a big ask. I know it needs some courage on all sides. I'm really determined from the constabulary's perspective that we will do that. Policing isn't perfect, but we are open. We are, I believe, one of the most transparent public services there is. I use the phrase, which is that we will hold the mirror up to ourselves and we will absolutely deal with what we find. I'm very proud of that. It takes a lot of courage from the colleagues I'm privileged to lead. Um, but we are, you know, my promise is if you come and work with us, there is a great career to be had uh, and you will work with great people um, and will help me and this police force make us even better and genuinely create the new black history because that's what I would really love to see. So it's wonderful to be here and part of this celebration today. Thank you for the warm welcome and allowing me this few minutes just to share the time. Thank you, Lou. Thank you very much, Chief Constable. Now, one of the key messages for Black History Month is education. And in Southampton, we are fortunate to have many institutions that support the celebration each year. And none more so than Solent University. So I am pleased to introduce Nona McDuff, Pro Vice Chancellor of Students and Teaching. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be sharing some of the work Solent University is doing to advance race equality. So as the Pro Vice Chancellor, my role is to provide the vision and the strategy to ensure students from diverse backgrounds can experience inclusive learning and teaching and can access the support they need to succeed in their studies. I get to work on many exciting projects, but I'm particularly pleased to be facilitating the work on the BAME awarding gap the inclusive curriculum framework, and some of you will know that speaks to the movements such as why is my curriculum white and I too am Harvard or whatever university you're, you're at. I'm also incredibly privileged to contribute to advocating for race equality through my role as chair of the Higher Education Race Action Group and membership of committees such as the university's UK advisory panel on racial harassment. Equality and diversity and inclusion is at the heart of what we do at SOLA. We're striving to get better day by day, and we continue to embed it across everything we do. We don't just accept difference. We see diversity as an inherent educational value. We support it for the benefit of our students, for our staff, and of course, for our community. During October last year, SOLA launched its um, Civic Charter outlining the commitments that we have to the city of Southampton. And we recognise at that time there was so much more as an institution we could be doing to actively advance racial equality. We continue in our commitment to be fair, diverse and a cohesive, inclusive university that challenges and tackles racial and social inequality. In Ju July, we added our voice and joined millions supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. I think we'd like to say that we are systematically tackling inequalities and differentials, 
through our commitment to, um, as my colleague from Southampton said, the, the Advanced HE's Race Charter Mark. I've done this at my previous institute, and I think it is a fantastic systematic framework to improve the uh, representation, the progression and success of staff and students of colour. I'm delighted to be facilitating this challenging scrutiny of our practices with two deans, Peter Lloyd and Di Bray. The university is a proud supporter of Black History Month, and we're delighted to have seen this campaign grow year after year. Like many key city events, we're really sad we can't see you in person this year or welcome you onto our campus for physical events to celebrate Black History Month. However, we do have a calendar of virtual events and activities lined up for the local community, our staff and our students and our alumni to get involved with. I can only give you a couple of highlights, which include a virtual public lecture, which will explore stories from black owned businesses and provide top tips to those who might be thinking of starting a business or a social enterprise. We have inspiring alumni career talks, Solent's Careers and Employability Services, Solent Futures, are planning two career talks from Black, Asian, minority, ethnic alumni to celebrate and inspire students. Staff and students can keep an eye on the portal for more information on this. We're having a fantastic celebration of Solent's Staff Bain Network through our an hour long discussion, encouraging staff and students to really think about race equality and find out more about this network. And we're running a series of workshops to really raise awareness of race equity in higher education and how we can take active steps at Solon. And um, we, you know, I talked about making our inclusive curriculum more embedded. I'm going to give a shout out to our students who, as part of a module, uh, were asked to research and create images for Black History Month. The results are outstanding and we'll be sharing those on our website. Solent's Library will also regularly feature Black writers whose books are available through the library on the social media channels at Solent Library. And this will be carried out throughout October for staff and students. Please, please do look out for Solent's involvement with Black History Month and you can find out more information on our website solent.ac.uk forward slash Black History Month. Um, we're really proud to have been delivering our commitments to our Civic Charter to race equality in the city for over a year now, and have enjoyed working together to achieve success, exchange knowledge, share skills and contribute resources. As we move into the next academic years, we're going to build upon our success of the previous year, developing a new formal long-term agreement with the community that enables us to deliver mutually beneficial and impactful activity. On a final note, I'd like to formally thank everyone who has contributed to this work and, have, and to making a difference in the last year. And we look forward to working with you as we go forward into the new academic year. Thank you. Many thanks for that, Nona. Um, following on the tradition of Southampton producing world-class talent such as Craig David, Artful Dodger, LST, and uh, Tyrone. Um, fresh from her sensational appearances on ITV's Voice Kids, with a pre-recorded performance, especially for this event, we are delighted to introduce to you Isla Kroll. Then you 
beauty and agree that everyone should be free. I wish I could give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live like I'm longing to live. I wish I could do all the things that I can do. No, I'm starting anew, and I'm way overdue. Well, I wish I could be like a bird in the sky. How sweet it would be if I. Then I'd sing, cause I know ya Then I'd sing, cause I know ya And I know how it feels How it feels to be free That is fantastic. Uh, so that's Isla Kroll and uh, She's at school today because she's only 15. That's amazing. Um, just to let you know also, her single will be out later this month. It's called All About You. So once you see it, please stream, download, buy it. Uh, let's support our local talent. Uh, so we've come to the point of the show that I really enjoy. This is um, our BHM Black History Month South Awards. Uh, so each year, we like to acknowledge individuals that have made a significant contribution to the black community in Southampton. And this year, we have four individuals that we feel deserve recognition. Our first award goes to Angela Chicken. Angela has been a long-term campaigner for equal rights for minority groups in Southampton and a wonderful supporter of Black History Month over many years. She's been active on black issues and at the forefront of the debate for Black Lives Matters. And she says, and I quote, I want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Well, I can say uncategorically, as far as Black History Month South is concerned, in our book, she has achieved that. So congratulations to Angela. Our next award goes to Sonia Forbes. Sonia and her family have been at the heart of Southampton for many years. Many of you will know her from her performances with the Harbour Light Steel Band, founded by the Forbes family that has graced the city with its music for over 50 years. However, many others will know her for her work within the community through her business, SM Ford's Funeral Directors in St. Mary's. She has always gone above and beyond to care for people in the community at some of their most difficult times. And Sonia says, I feel it is a privilege for me when families allow me into their homes and lives in order to help them through difficult and often traumatic times. And so for that, we at Black History Month South would like to say thank you and congratulations, Sonia. Our next award goes to Jean Holmes Morris. Jean arrived from Jamaica in 1962 and spent 38 years nursing in the NHS in various roles and became the head of the School of Nursing in Winchester later on in her career. But in Basingstoke, she's known as the go-to person for the Basingstoke Caribbean Society and Friends, whether as vice chair of their society or organizing parties and christenings, she's always been at the heart of the community. And I quote from her very good friend, Grace Powell, she is the left and right hand of everything we do. 
So on behalf of the Basingstoke Caribbean Society and Friends, I would like to say congratulations, Jean. Our final award this year goes to a young lady who has definitely made her mark in the city. She has always been at the forefront of amplifying black voices in Southampton. With her work on Unity 101, numerous roles in the community, and now with her social enterprise called Our Version Media, and its focus on empowering black communities to tell their own stories in their own way. And she's sitting right next to me. Ladies and gentlemen, Veronica Gordon. And I've got this little thing for you right here, Veronica, which is, I'm going to pass it over, and hopefully I won't drop it. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And that concludes our Black History Month South Awards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, as we move on to the next um, part, Southampton is preparing to enter a bid to become UK City of Culture 2025. Um, We are fortunate to have leading the charge for the city, Claire Whittaker, OBE, Director of Southampton City of Culture. I'd like to welcome Claire to say a few words about the city's bid. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. I'm going to be sharing a presentation with you that tells you a little bit about uh, our bid for to be UK City of Culture 2025. But before I start, congratulations to the award winning award winners and to Isla for a fantastic performance. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about me uh, because I've got 30 years of working within culture and the wider society. Um, I ran my my own events and music organisation, which produced the annual London Jazz Festival. And I've taken part in many national moments, such as the Manchester Commonwealth Games, the Queen's Golden Jubilee in 2020 and 2002, the London 2012 Olympics, Hull and Coventry City of Culture programmes. And I produced the opening ceremony for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Buckingham Palace uh, in 2018. I have worked extensively internationally across Europe, uh, but also in Western Southern Africa, particularly the Caribbean and North America. And I suppose my career highlight would probably be um, delivering BT River of Music as part of London 2012 celebrations, which had representation from all 204 Olympic and Paralympic nations. Um, But other things which are relevant today is... um, My practice is really informed by the work that I did with the ANC after the first democratic elections. And I set up an organization called Business Arts South Africa, which had Tabo Mbaki as its president. And the charity that I ran had um, President Nelson Mandela, Her Majesty the Queen, and President Leopold Senghor as its patrons. Um, I worked for 10 years uh, with the Metropolitan uh, Black Police Association, producing a program called Celebration of Life, which look to spread the word of peace. But I've also worked as an equality, diversity and um, uh, inclusion consultant. And this has really informed my practice. I wanted to show you a little bit about some of the artists that I've worked with, including Baba Mal, Lady Smith Black Mambazo, Angelique Kijo, Hugh Masakela, Marisa and Wynton Marsalis, Alison Hines and Burning Spear, and Jazz Jamaica. And I hope those names show you where some of my musical interests uh, lie and why I enjoyed Isla's performance so much. Um, But now to tell you a little bit more about UK City of Culture. So UK City of Culture is a designation given to a city for a period of one year. Um, Its aim is to give other cities the opportunity to experience similar success to Liverpool, which was European capital of culture in 2008. Um, The competition is administered by the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport and has a panel of independent judges. And it really does bring tangible benefits to the city that wins. The slide here shows some of the economic uh, impact that Liverpool received, um, which was uh, over 753 million pounds of regeneration and economic impact across Liverpool, Merseyside and the Northwest region. And also um, just the huge number of visitors who attended Liverpool's year and the economic impact that that had. Also now moving on to Hull, 
Hull had over three hundred million pounds of value of tourism, and um, more than nine in ten residents engage with at least one cultural activity. Another um, amazing statistic was the amount of people that volunteered in Hull, and they they said that there was a volunteer in every street. But these are all statistics that I'm hoping that we will beat in our bid. So, what timeline are we working on? Um, in uh, in February, we have to register our bid, and at the moment, what we're doing is really preparing for that, and we're about to embark on a major consultation program, which will be launched next week. Um, we have to then uh, prepare our bid over the summer months and put our final bid in in September 2021, where we have a visit to the city from uh, the judges, and they ask lots of questions about our bid, and we refine our plans. And then we have to present to the judges in November and they announce the winning bid in December next year. And who are we up against in terms of competition? Um, Bradford, Medway, Lancashire as a county have all declared their interest to bid and also Gloucester. Um, Medway and Bradford are very, very serious competitors. We're waiting to see what an all county bid will look like from Lancashire. Um, but we are hoping that we will be the front runners in the southwest. Um, so, what would you, winning UK City of Culture mean? Well, it would really help us in our post-COVID recovery. It would put us on the map, both um, nationally and internationally. We would have huge economic benefit. We would be able to um, generate more jobs and raise aspirations and skills and new businesses will be attracted to Southampton. And also, it would create a real sense of pride in the city and put cultural regeneration at the heart of our plans. I talked earlier about volunteering, um, and this is an area which I really would hope that everyone in Southampton will be interested in taking part. I said there was a volunteer from every street, and you can see from the quote that the volunteers really got a lot out of the process. Um, and then moving on, what is our ambition? Our ambition is to develop a successful winning bid and to harness civic pride at the heart of what we do. We want to listen to our local community and make sure that we shape the programme around the things that they want to see from the bid. Um, we do want to develop our tourism. We want more people to know about the heritage in, South, in Southampton, and that's heritage in the widest sense as well as culture in the widest sense. That includes everything that we do, sport, cooking, where we go and how we do it. And we want to make sure that the effect of the winning bid goes further than Southampton into the wider region. But I did want to um, just tell you now about what happens next week um, because we have a range of media partners and our launch is going to be on the 7th of October. And you can see here that we really have a spread of both newspapers and radio stations that are, are helping us get the message out. And what we want to do is to hear the stories, um, your stories of Southampton, and to get um, everybody that loves uh, what Southampton is and what it could be involved in shaping our thoughts and ideas. On, on the 7th, what we would like you to do, or before that, is to sign up to our social media channels and help get the message out there. But if you're interested in City of Culture, if you're interested in helping us shape that conversation, if you want to be involved as a volunteer, um, then please do let us know. Um, it's very, very important that we hear from you and we, that we take into account your views to help us shape what we are absolutely determined will be a winning bid. Um, thank you so much, Lou, for inviting me to speak. Um, it's been a great morning so far, and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so, we're moving on to our keynote speaker. Now, before we reach, before we get to that, I just want to let you know that we've had some technical issues. Uh, we're, we seem to have resolved them, I hope. So, Richie, I hope you're with us. Um, our keynote speaker this year is a former professional footballer. He played for Birmingham City and is an outspoken commentator on race issues. He's someone who I had the pleasure of meeting at one of the first times I attended a Black History Month launch. 
So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Richie Moran. You may agree with some of it, you may vehemently disagree. Um, but I'm sure, hopefully, it will make you think and you will go away with some thought. OK, as Lou said, I was a professional footballer. I played for Birmingham City and I played for a Japanese side called Fujita. Um, I've lived and travelled all over the world. Um, I've also been, I worked in the mental health sector for 12 years. Um, I've, I've had a range of experiences. And one which I feel qualifies me to speak as well is that I was actually adopted by an Anglo-Irish family. Um, so I have white brothers and sisters. And suffice it to say, out of the six of them, there is only one that I still speak to. Right, so let's get going. Um, it's been a momentous, momentous year for Black Lives Matter and with a worldwide pandemic. Now, literally two weeks before I was born, Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, on the same day, conversely as well, Roy Hackett in Bristol was starting the Black Bus Boycott because black people weren't allowed in Bristol to work on the buses. Now, 57 years later, I have to look at things and ask what, what's happened? What have, what have we achieved? Um, we are now, I fear, heading back to some of the deepest, darkest times that we've ever had. Um, we have the advent of people like Trump and our own Prime Minister. And let's not drop it up, let's not dress it up in terms. Let's not call them populists. Let's call them what they are. They are racist. And Trump is getting as near to fascism and a return to 1930s global star propaganda as, as I've ever seen. And it isn't just him, and it isn't just Johnson. There are other there are other leaders around the world, such as Z, Erdogan, Putin, Bolsonaro, Duterte. Bin Salman, Modi, very sadly Aung San Suu Kyi and Lukashenko to name but a few, whose suppression of their people and minorities is beyond the pale. Now, let's start with sl slavery. Slavery for me stands alongside the Holocaust as the single greatest crime against humanity bar none. I don't think there can be many questions, but if you look at America, the country that always defines itself as the land of the free and the greatest the greatest country in democracy. For me, it's the worst. Um, and I've spent a couple of months there. And in addition to, to the other things I've done, I also speak French, Japanese and Spanish. So I have a multitude of experiences and racism all over the world. Um, if you look at the way America, America's whole history, it was born out of the genocide of its Native American people. It then transported millions of my, my our brethren across from Africa to start to work and slave to have every every aspect of their lives dehumanized, their whole, their culture stripped, their language stripped, their heritage stripped, their name stripped. And when you think about it, I don't know if anybody's ever watched recently, it's been a wonderful, wonderful series by Henry Louis Gates, which which fully states which states about all the African cultures, all the fantastic culture that existed in in Africa before the Europeans intervened. Um, we had kings and queens, we had history, culture, all sorts of inventions which are overlooked. And that's, that's a scary thing about today, it's the narrative. One of the most important movements at the moment is Black Lives Matter. But already there's been a backlash in the media, which I always knew there would be. And when it comes to, when it comes to people like Trump and their overt racism, they're, they're allowed to be described as populist, as, a, as opposed to racist. Um, Black Lives Matter, Matter and, and 
suddenly being described as Marxist and all sorts of things. Now, a lot of the people who describe them as Marxist wouldn't know Marxism if Karl Marx slapped them around the boat race with the Marxist manifesto, to be honest. Um, they, they have a very, very worthy cause born out of necessity. After, after the genocide of the Native Americans, and the, the Americans actually fought a war to continue to own us. Uh, please, please, I must apologise at this juncture if, if my speech seems a bit hesitant. It's just I can hear myself echoing. But um, I'll continue. They fought a war. They fought a war to preserve us, to preserve owning us, to preserve owning us, and then formed one of the greatest terrorist organisations of all time, which never gets mentioned, the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan, between, they hung mostly black men from trees. It was over 4,000 up, up to 1950s. Yeah, it never gets, very rarely gets mentioned in the, in the teachings of American history. Yet, they, they, will state, they will state that 9-11 was a great terrorist attack, which it was. But then again, I've been to Hiroshima and I've witnessed what I consider the single greatest terrorist attack in history, the dropping of the atom bombs, which again never gets mentioned. And that was after they'd actually um, interned all their Japanese citizens after Pearl Harbor. Now for me, I find it very, very strange as well how anti-fa, anti-fascist can suddenly be a, a bad term. Surely World War II was fought to defeat the scourge of fascism. Or, or have I got that wrong somewhere along the way? But now, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, as I already stated, that the propaganda used by the American government now against Antifa and Black Lives Matter is akin to what Goebbels had. And it's frightening to think how, how the Nazis would have prospered had Goebbels had, you know, Twitter and Facebook and, and all those mediums. But so they're, they're seeking to control the narrative. And it is an entire white supremacist narrative. I don't know if anybody saw last night the debate between, well, what passes for a debate between Biden and Trump, uh, where it was like two schoolboys shouting at each other, really, with Trump trying to bully everybody in his customary. And the thing with Trump is, as I find Johnson as well, whether or not you agree, I, th I think that the so-called leaders of the Western world are two of the biggest lying, mendacious, narcissistic, um, narcissistic, power-grabbing people that, that, that have ever taken power. And it, it's actually quite frightening. And, and just, to, just as an example as well, one thing I want you to think about, one of the most racist regimes in history, the apartheid regime in South Africa, actually had a black president a whole generation before, before the Americans ever had a black president. And I want you to think about that. And Nelson Mandela, again, possibly, the for me, the greatest single living human being of the 20th century or any other. Um, and also, if you look at the things that have happened, you look during slavery, there was the one drop rule after the Jim Crow rules, which that enhanced segregation. And the one drop rule said that if you had one drop of black blood, you, you, you were black. Jack Johnson, the famous black heavyweight champion of the world, he was prosecuted for the, under the miscegenation rules for having the temerity to marry a white woman. Yet, if you walk around the slave plantations, just have a check, have a check at how many mixed race, race slaves there were, because it was all right apparently for the slave masters to rape the to rape the slave women. And also, America has greatly distorted its history, as has this country. George Washington was a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson was not only a slave owner, he had children who, that, by his slave girl Sally Hemings, who, until, who have only been acknowledged through DNA in the last 20 or so years. Um, Ab Abraham Lincoln is the greatest one for me. He was no abolitionist. He made a speech actually saying that if he could protect the Union without freeing one slave, he would do so. Now that took me, but yet these people are lauded as, as heroes in history. But they certainly ain't no heroes of mine. Likewise, if you look at this country, the history of this country, from Elizabethan times onwards, 3.1 Africans were shipped mainly to the Caribbean to slavery. Um, they, again, they were murdered, murdered, raped, massacred, and families such as the families of David Cameron, Graham Greene, 
George Orwell and and many others, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and others, when slavery was abolished here, they profited to the tune of what would be the equivalent of £17 billion today. If they did not compensate the slaves, who free, they compensated the slave owners. Now, what does that tell you? Um, again, when it comes to education, there, there's a very, very... There's a thin narrative, a thin narrative, a strand that preaches only, only one sort of history. No one, again, will, can, dispute, can dispute the role that Churchill played in the war as a leader. But what you can dispute, well, what is not up for dispute, is also that he was a supreme eugenicist. And let's, let's we not forget again, eugenics was a science invented by white people to prove their genetic superiority. He, again, people talk about, I've heard people go into all sorts of furore about um, paint statues and removal statues. No one's trying to rewrite history. History is, is what it is. But it also needs to be acknowledged um, what what Ch the likes of Churchill did. Churchill, indeed, like we said, he was a great he was a great leader of, it, during the war, but he was also responsible for the disaster in Gallipoli. He unleashed the black and tans on the Catholic population of Ireland. He was directly responsible for the Bengal famine, which led to the dead death of three million people. Um, during he was also he was at least responsible for the torture of the Kikuyu tribe during the Mau Mau rebellion. And in the space of five years, there was over over 1,000 people put to death and executed on the order of the British government in another country that the British had no right to be in. So, yes, I think the statues belong in a museum, but, and, and, but they belong with context, as, as Edward Colston. Now, I saw people going mad on the outside and saying how disgraceful it was about his statue being toppled. But isn't it ironic that he was toppled into the very, very... He was toppled into the very, very harbour where they flew the black slaves. So, again, you know, please don't expect me to feel any sorrow. Um, I hope, like I say, I hope you can all still hear. Um, if you look now, look at the killings in America. Breonna Taylor. Brett Hankinson, the has been charged with, with reckless endangerment for shooting three bullets into the white neighbours next door. The six bullets that actually killed that innocent worker seem to be irrelevant. I'm sure everybody in that room has seen the, the murder of George Floyd on t TV. And I'm not going to call it the alleged murder. You, it's been seen. It's been seen on the telly. It's murder. The man had his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And yet... Trump and others try and try and change the narrative. They talk about rioting and they talk about antifa. Rioting is the effect. Murder is the cause. Let's have a clear, clear distinguishment between the two. So I, I'm now, I must confess, I'm as angry as I've ever been. And the stuff that I went through as a child during my football, it cost me my football career because I'd refused to accept the racism that was directed at me. And it's cost me an inordinate amount of money and other stuff besides. But I thought, I thought the scars that I bear, physical and mental, I thought they would be over. I have a beautiful 24-year-old son. And I thought this would all be done by the time, I thought he would never have to face any of this, but he still has. And that's what makes me angry beyond belief. Um, I look now at our brave, our brave people. And, I, and again, one, one of the things I don't like is the terms we're given. I haven't, I haven't used the term BAME or BAME because I don't like it. I, I'm a black man. It's the same I've said to some of my white friends as well. I was never given a choice or we were never given a choice. Nobody ever asked me if I wanted to be called nigger or negro or coloured or anything else. It was something that was all foisted upon me. And, and it's the same with BAME. I don't like the term and it's one that I prefer not to use. Um, and I've actually fallen out with quite a few of my white friends over the whole Black Lives Matter issue. And um, I've talked about the statues and the stuff. And one of the things that's actually got me, and I said to him the other day, even if that my politics have never exactly been a secret, but there was one sort of quite visual clue that I've given them over the years, which I thought they might, they might seize on to find out where my sympathies lie. But obviously I missed that. 
Um, I'm not quite sure how much more time I've got, so I'd appreciate if someone would let me know at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> but again, th there's been lots of positive stuff talked about today. I, I actually believe that we are in such a crucial time for, for black people and, and ethnic minorities in this country, in America and around the world. I, I do believe if Donald Trump gets re-elected, which unfortunately I think he will use any means to ensure that it happens, I think it will be open season on black people in America. I really do. Um, it, it, it's gone from lynching, from the all out lynching to now, now the lynching is extrajudicial. And it's not just in this country too, and it's not just, it's not just random, it's Breonna Taylor, it's Philando Castile, it's Eric Garner, it's Mike Brown, it's Walter Scott, it's Sandra Bland, it's Freddie Gray, it's both, both and John, who was shot by the police officer who said, she, was, she thought he was in her apartment, which wasn't even on the same floor. I mean, she did get jailed for 10 years, but I watched her court case and she just painted herself as the victim when she'd murdered a man in cold blood and that's it, pure and simple. Um, another argument I have with people is they, they say, oh, this country isn't the same. Rest assured, it is. I can give you a myriad of examples of things that have happened to me and my, and my family and friends. Um, even down to the fact that I, one of my best friends in the whole world, 41 years on, his father still won't speak to me. When I married a white woman, none of her family would come to the wedding. But that, that's incidental. It's not about me. It's about the bigger picture. So there, there's a lot more I've got to say. Um, and like, like I say, Black History Matters is the theme. So I think kids in this country, I want them to be taught about the role that Elizabeth I, Francis Drake, John Hawkins, Edward Colston, James Penny, and that all played in slavery. I want kids to be taught. I want kids to be taught about Garrett Morgan, who, who, who invented the traffic light, a black man. Lewis Latimer, who invented the carbon filament for the, app, for the, for the light bulb. Right. OK, it seems now I feel very privileged and I, I don't apologise if this is construed as overly negative. It's the way it has, it's the way it has to be. And th these are times that are very, very necessary. So um, thank you all for listening. I apologise again for the sound quality. And just remember, Black Lives Matter. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Richie Moran for such a hard-hitting speech. Really, really, we really appreciate you for your views and your opinions. Uh, that was very, very informative, very strong, and yeah, very thoughtful. Thank you very much. So, on behalf of Veronica, Olu, and myself, I would like to thank Woodrow Kernahan, Diana Jokey, Lynn Dick and everyone at the John Hansard Gallery for accommodating us today. Thank you to all our speakers and contributors and a big thank you to Josh McGowan and his team from SBS Events for keeping us on air. And also thank you to all of you for joining us. All that remains for me to say is keep an eye on our Facebook page uh, for all the Black History Month events going on in Southampton. And welcome to Black History Month 2020. Thank you very much. Keep it, keep it rolling.